Hi everybody, welcome back to the Venetian Conference Center in Las Vegas. We're here covering VMware Explorer 2024, Dave Vellante with Rob Strecce. This is our 15th year covering VMworld, VMware Explorer. We're super excited to be here. Two sets, we've been going all week. We're wrapping up day three. We've been talking about private AI. We're going to talk about network ethernet. We're going to talk about customer challenges and use cases with Ram Balaga and Chris Wolf. Chris is the global head of AI and advanced services for VMware Cloud Foundation Division at Broadcom. You're in the right place, Chris. And uh, Ram Velaga is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for Core Switching, the group at Broadcom. Gents, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you again. Thank you for having us. Always great. So, been a good three days, and, uh, and you guys are still going strong. There's a lot of people here. What are you hearing from customers, Ram? What's, uh, what's the vibe like? Oh, so we are from the silicon side of you know, Broadcom, right? So they're like, generally I hear from customers, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, what are they're, you doing yeah, here? Yeah, what am I doing here? So I'm like, hey guys, you know what? You know, let me kind of explain to you, when you start thinking about AI, yeah, it's all about distributed computing. And when you're doing distributed computing, it's a lot of GPUs and you have to connect them together with the network. And that's what we do. You know, my team basically does networking and we work very closely with the very, very large cloud providers. Previously they were deploying CPUs, now they're deploying you know, GPUs. All kind of goes over an ethernet network. So you know, we look at where AI is going into the enterprise and we believe it should be built on ethernet, so we are here. Well we saw you at the um, financial analyst meeting uh, earlier this year, same week as GTC, uh, yeah. which was awesome. John and I were there. Of course, we had Charlie Kawas on at, uh, at MWC. The whole premise being the world is shifting from a CPU-centric to a Connect-centric world, and you guys make all that stuff work together, which is all the hard stuff that <laughs> nobody wants to do, uh, but if you can figure it out, it's a great business. Uh, so Chris, we were talking last night uh, at the bar, uh, Really interesting strategy that you guys are affecting. You saw a piece from a couple weeks ago. I think you were saying we got much of it right. There were some things that maybe we need to fine tune, but what are you hearing from customers uh, at this event? How's, how is the message resonating? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, just if we want to just lead with price. Like, we're tremendous validation for what we're doing, uh, recognition that running AI services on VCF uh, can be uh, considerable cost savings as compared to public AI services. We've had a number of organizations look at us as next steps. I was meeting with the CIO of a state last night and our conversation was around what specific GPUs do I need for my use case? Like they're ready to go. We have a number of POCs. I would imagine coming out of the show at least two dozen POCs we're going to run with customers. Uh, just tremendous momentum for what we're doing and um, uh, real uh, excitement around this whole suite now of uh, advanced AI services that we're running on top of our platform, plus everything that we're doing with our, our infrastructure scheduling and optimizations have been a real point of excitement for customers too. Yeah, I, I, I got to see you guys earlier today and I, I think again, one of the things I learned a long time ago back in my, when I was a networking nerd uh, and <laughs> things like that, in IT for that matter, uh, was not to bet against ethernet. I remember ATM to the desktop was a thing at one point in time. It, it reminds me of InfiniBand and in fact, funny enough, we were talking about InfiniBand and I, I've actually uh, run an InfiniBand network so I probably was one of the oh, few wow. people in that room who's actually done that. I, I think that it makes total sense that it's Ethernet, and I think you had some pretty astounding uh, statistics that you had seen in, around how many, you know, just how many uh, connected devices across Ethernet. And for me, why, where it kind of ties in with private AI, and I kind of want to understand this and get your view on this, is that there is the front end network and then there's the back-end network that is the east-west traffic and the north-south traffic so that applications can take advantage of the AI as well as moving the data around and connecting things together. Kind of go into what you've been seeing out of the, the hyperscalers because I think they, you know, again, you had some pretty amazing numbers there and even if you can't share the exact numbers, it was still, uh, I think, when people look at how they're building these networks out, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, so when you, when you look at an you know, GPU uh, architecture, right? When you're doing machine learning, as I said before, anything related to AI, generally the workload cannot be run on a single GPU. You need a collection of you know, GPUs together. 
And generally, when you think about how this works, you, you probably go to, you know, let's say ChatGPT or someplace, you type your question. The question that's typed goes to the CPU. The CPU takes that question, breaks it up into a bunch of you know, tokens, words, tokens, and those are digitized. And that, that information is then fed to a collection of you know, GPUs. That's how inference works. Now prior to inference, obviously you're doing you know, training, training of large language models. And when this happens, essentially what's happening is there's a lot of parameters that are being exchanged between those GPUs. That exchange of parameters between those GPUs is usually what you think of as the backend network. The GPU is talking to each other, exchanging the parameters, coming out with this coefficients, put this regression equations, and so on and so forth, all those matrix multiplications that happens. How you access those GPUs, how you push data into it in the first place, is that what you think of as the front-end network. So there's kind of a misnomer that is, oh, Ethernet is only used for the front-end network. All this back-end, which is significantly higher capacity, is based on you know, something other than Ethernet. But the reality is when you think about the largest cloud deployments today, right, whether it is Amazon, Meta, you know, Google, uh, you know, Alibaba, ByteDance, Tencent, Oracle, all of the back-end of their GPU interconnect is based on Ethernet. Not the front, not just the front end, the back end, right? And these are not clusters which are small, hundreds of clusters uh, of GPUs per cluster. These are 10 to 60,000 plus GPUs in a cluster. And these are all publicly stated you know, numbers. The numbers are actually much bigger than 10 to 60,000. I can only kind of point you to publicly available information, but very large clusters, all connected over Ethernet and doing very, very well in terms of performance as well as the economics. Well, I, I mean, I've sort of spitballed out there saying that the, the big internet companies want to, they want to get to a million you know, GPU clusters. That's where they're headed. And it was interesting listening to Charlie um, talk about the ROI of the consumer AI, very clear. You build bigger clusters, you're going to be able to target better and you're right. going to be able to print yep. money. Yep. In the enterprise, I, I say the, the, the ROI is kind of chatty, right? It's little singles that people are hitting right now. You know, tech summarization, maybe do some, some you know, marketing copy, uh, chatbots obviously, code generation. Nice things, but the really interesting stuff is yet to come. Um, you know, we've, we've written the, the Cube Research, put out the, the Gen AI power law, talking about really where private AI is where I'm getting to. Um, as things that are going to be done on-prem. They might be small language models, they might actually be larger language models, but it's going to be uh, private, proprietary data sets that actually solve bigger problems and drive bigger ROI. So, Chris, private AI, big, big thrust around that. Uh, help us understand what customers want to do and how that evolution is likely to occur. Yeah, so, Right now, the typical customer, so I, I think there's two classes here. So you have the customer that has been running what they would call ML, so if we rewind, right, we used to call this ML. Legacy like not AI. Too long ago. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> they've been doing this for years, and what they've seen us come along with with our platform and how we can do distributed resource scheduling at scale for them, we're solving problems that they have not been good at with their own DIY approaches on bare metal. So that's one class of customers. So we're already converting them now to our platform and we're seeing a, a stronger than expected traction there. Uh, then the second set, this is to your question more on the generative AI side, they're looking for their first successful use case. And we're helping to guide them into what that is because what they want to do is pick something that's not just in the abstract, give me something where I can measure the actual business value. And the easiest thing and the most repeatable thing that we see across every customer segment is really your call center, the contact center use case. Because I know in a given week, this is the number of tickets that my agent closes, right? When I bring in generative AI, I might see a five to 10% efficiency gain uh, in terms of how many more tickets they're closing, right? That's a measurable number that adds value to the business that's really cut and dry. And that's, th that's what we're seeing as the first place that they start. And this is something where they can start relatively small with their private data. So, it might be you know, one or two clusters to begin with, and then as they continue to onboard employees, right, then they can just continue to horizontally scale that. That's been a very common pattern that we're seeing, and we're going to continue to repeat that, I would think, for the next couple of years. 
Uh, you know, other use cases are catching up, but that's where we're guiding people because we want them to have a successful result and we want them to be able to prove business value. What are the headwinds that they face? We know we write a lot about you know, privacy and the, the legal compliance, those are, are sort of well known. Uh, I presume you're seeing that. What else are you seeing that customers are telling you are some of the challenges that they're facing? Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is still the accessibility of hardware. Like, I still need to be able to get enough GPUs to run some of these services, so that's key. Um, you know, there's still a, a fragmented ecosystem. Like, customers are asking for interoperability, but it's easier said than done. You don't have a truly interoperable software stack today, right? It doesn't exist. Uh, there's parts that exist, right? But you don't have that true end-to-end -end solution. But it's not stopping the AI applications, and that's why we've led with NVIDIA, because you know, there's a lot of uh, trust for NVIDIA hardware. You know, we're having good success getting customers uh, reaching successful outcomes on their GPUs. And you know, the supply chain is what it is, but for some of the lower hanging fruit use cases, we can get them started on the L40S, and then we can graduate them from there. We do have, at the far end, we would have customers that are taking 8X H100 and putting those per node, and that's like um, definitely in the financial services space, that's typically the design pattern that we're going for. It's like, let's just build this thing right the first time and then scale it. Uh, one other observation I would say that really matters is we're starting to see this bifurcation where the data science teams might have gone out and bought some DGXs and they're using that for some R&D work, but when it comes time to actually operate the service in production and run these inferencing use cases, that's when they're coming to us because we have all the operational controls, we can support security, audit, all of those things, and uh, give them that efficiency of being able to share that uh, AI capacity. And I'm saying AI capacity because people focus on the GPU, but that's just one part of it, right? It's, it's, the, it's the network, it's memory, there's lots of other parts that are going to comprise that application. So those are the, that's where we're seeing things going now, and our, I think our roadmap is going to get even more exciting where we're looking at more advanced ways to do scheduling and workload placement that's beyond what you're seeing from anybody else today. So of course the spinning disk used to be the bottleneck you know, in the system, and then NAND prices came down and the volumes went up and changed all that. Is networking now the new, the new bottleneck and the big challenge from an infrastructure standpoint? Um, I, I would say the good thing about networking is the networking bandwidth has been scaling quite a bit, uh, right? Uh, if you just look at our you know, history of chips that we've been coming out with, in the last few years we went from 12.8 terabit chips to 25 terabit chips to 50 terabit chips, and you know, most people can predict when we will have a 100 terabit you know, uh, you know, device coming out. Mm -hmm. So the network bandwidth is keeping up. You obviously have to architect your network with this high bandwidth you know, devices. Um, as we scale bandwidth, I think the interconnecting between these switches, what you know, today is copper cables, and some of this would have to be optical cables, and you know, that is where I think more work needs to be done, but networking is there, it's ready to take this challenge on. Yeah. So when you say, we talk about, I mean, you'd, you'd like to avoid optical, I presume, yeah. wherever you can, because yes. of the cost, Yes. and you're, you must be pushing copper pretty hard yes. these days. Yeah. Yep. You know, absolutely, we, we'll push copper as hard as we can. For example, our 100 gig 30s today have a reach of four meter distances. Soon we will have products which are based on 200 gig 30s. Just the nature of the fact that it is twice the data rate means the reach will be lower, but still you're going to try to pack as much as you can you know, within the reach of copper. But at some point beyond that, when you're building these very large clusters, you, know, you will have a lot of fiber running around. 30s, your secret sauce. Exactly. <laughs> I would assume even, I mean, even you brought this up earlier today with the whole over the when you were connecting multiple data centers yes. together as well. Yes. And and I would assume and, and I I pushed you on this a little bit earlier today about how to connect the, the full stack cuz we're talking about VCF, we're talking about private AI running on top of that and you're now you have NSX in there and you talked about this I, I thought eloquently when, we, when I pushed you on it a little bit about, hey, there's that control plane, the different control planes that you have to have. It kind of elaborate on that for, for people who are looking at it going, okay, you're talking silicon, I'm talking NSX and different things. What, how does, how to bring that thread together for people? Sure. When we talk about silicon, we're talking about our silicon that kind of goes into these pizza boxes or chassis that makes a physical switch, switch slash router. These are very high bandwidth devices, anything from 25 terabits to 50 terabits to multiple of hundreds of terabits together put into a physical box. Historically, there wasn't a real clean separation between 
you know, how do you actually do things like overlay networks? And how do you do a very good physical network underneath? But when you look at large clouds, large cloud providers, they've done a very good job at it. They said, hey look, let me deploy a very high performance network, and that's based on the fastest speeds which are available, whether 25 gig in the past, or 100 gig you know, today, and so on and so forth, and build a very large topology. Now, on top of that, we want to be able to have, let's say, multiple different customers, and we want to keep all these customers separated. So you have some kind of a segmentation between these customers. You don't have to do that segmentation in the network, right? When you try to do it right inside the physical network, you're trying to make sure every time you have to deal with segmentation, you have to change the underlying physical network. Instead, they're saying, let the network do what it does very well, connecting point A and point B at very high speeds, very reliability, very reliability with the right you know, QoS attributes. But when I want to do things like segmentation, security, isolation, I can do that in the upper layer, right? That is where they would use their own you know, internal software or this is where customers could use something like NSX which will provide you the segmentation. And you can let the decisions happen independently. The control plane and what you do segmentation and security could be done completely differently from, oh, I need to get faster speeds right now. I need to go to the next bandwidth point. I need much more you know, uh, 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 burst absorption capability. So you can separate those two out and both of them can operate as ships in the dark. Yeah, and we, we were talking just yesterday as well around the, how the, the private AI stack and how organizations are looking to have more of that control. And they want, you were talking about, hey, we, you know, you, your internal use case where you've switched models some, some crazy amount of times to go and see that. How does that work with, as well, because the network comes into effect because the data is not, is, everybody wishes it was all in one place, but the data is not all in one place, and how you're bringing that together as well. Yeah, and I, I mean, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit, because like, our thesis on private AI is, if you take your same terrible IaaS that you keep trying to homegrown and build yourself, right, and think you're going to do automate a complex AI application across it and be successful, you're fooling yourself. I think that's first and foremost. Like the approach that enterprises have tried to take to private clouds for the last 20 years, piecemealing the thing, bringing in all of these different pieces and parts, and building an orchestrating orchestration layer above it, thinking you're going to have the right level of reliability and the lowest cost, zero chance. So the first thing we had to do is get really opinionated to say, if you really want to do private cloud right, you need to have an integrated solution. That's, that's without question. You're not going to be successful without it. You're going to, your costs are going to be higher, you're going to have higher challenges with reliability, you know, and so forth. So it's get your IaaS house in order first, then we can start to do all of this incredible orchestration that we do above it. And that's been what's really key. And that's where our products are really standing out. There is nobody that has anything to the sophistication of our distributed resource scheduler. It's not even close. And now how we're able to look at uh, GPU profiles, understand different like memory blocks that we want to pre-allocate and reserve. These are things that you're just not finding uh, by anybody else in the, in the industry. And this is where you're going to see you know, far better intelligent orchestration for, and placement for AI workloads and then load balancing where we need to. Right? So this is, this is how we're seeing you know, architecturally a lot of this come together. And then what we're doing is just, we're working now, I'd say, you know, if you're thinking about what's coming next on this, right, we're, we're building capabilities that are looking at the size of the model, uh, the context window, understanding how many inference endpoints are we expecting, right, and what is the frequency of that, so we can start to pre-size out expected capacity for these workloads, and then optimize as we need to as well with the monitoring tools that we have. So obviously, your, your cost comparisons, Hawks, uh, Keynote, really, laid up your stack versus in the cost relative to the public cloud uh, and the cost advantages. He told a story in the analyst meeting about um, what your CIO did in terms of uh, doing the RFP, the cloud guys came in two and a half to four X more expensive. You guys spend around only 1% uh, of revenue on IT, very, very efficient. So compare what you were just describing to my options in the cloud, and we talk about the cloud sometime, like it's just, you know, it's all the same thing. AWS, you have these fragmented services, but really strong services. Microsoft's got abstractions on abstractions. Google, some in between, great data uh, chops. How do customers think about um, those alternatives, and what's your message to them? Yeah, it's, it, to me this is why repatriation is such a, a huge trend right now. 
you know, like uh, Stephen Elliott was even citing earlier this week that it's, uh, you know, in the 80 percentile. We've seen other research as well, I believe it's from Barclays, that has seen similar types of trends. So there's um, a strong uh, desire to start to move back. And this is, and move back doesn't mean you have to build a data center. We have plenty of uh, service provider partners that would give you the capacity so you can still maintain that control at a far lower cost than what you're paying on a hyperscaler today. Right, and all of the things that we do through virtualization to provide infrastructure, opti infrastructure optimizations, that goes to the customer's margin. Right, they're putting that back in their pocket and that's what's also helping to drive down the cost. So we know, and our customers know, they're, they're paying the public cloud premium for the velocity. Right, that's what they're paying for and there is valid use cases for that. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not all or nothing. We don't expect it to be, but that said, Everybody knows if you can have a well-run private cloud and if you can simplify it, your costs on-premises are dramatically lower. And even our on-premises competitors, uh, there's, there's some competitors today that their prices are 2X ours. They're double. Like, look at their list prices. You can find it right from their price books. So we're beating our competitors on price on-prem. We're, we're superior to the public cloud as well when it comes to total cost of ownership. And these are just facts, it's basic math. So, so it is what it is. So and I, I think one, one point I'd love that you made uh, this week and uh, I'll kind of throw you a softball for this one, right? Is the, the, and it's kind so of I can go, follow up with yeah, the hardball. Yeah, oh, 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 I would expect <laughs> nothing less. Good, good cop, bad cop, right? So, uh, so, so and you brought up somebody like an AWS with Bedrock and how you're going to be feature, you know, you know, parity and things like that. How do you, how do you, how have you found in the last nine months really leaning into that innovation? Because to me, that's, I mean, having been at AWS, I understand how they work under, internally and how they're really focused on that innovation. How are you seeing that happen now that you're part of Broadcom in the last nine months? It's, uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I, the efficiencies that Broadcom has brought to our software division have allowed us to really work across a group of senior engineers that are execution machines that know how to get things done. We've taken out a lot of layers of bureaucracy that have allowed the company to be able to be decisive and innovate faster. Uh, there has certainly been zero slowdown. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we announced Private AI, you know, a year ago, right? And yes, we're we expect in VCF9 we're going to have feature parity with Vertex AI, AWS Bedrock all the core services you're going to have, but there's a key difference, uh, or a couple, right? Lower costs, full control of your data, and also our ISV ecosystem. It is very difficult if you're an AI ISV to approach a customer with a hyperscaler, because that hyperscaler is selling their own AI services. So they're directly competing against the ISV that's trying to partner with them. We're not a direct competitor. It's very easy for the ISVs to work with us because we're just going to approach customers together and get to a good outcome. Uh, so it's really uh, those differences, I think, is what's helping us to stand as uh, aside uh, from the, what, where the hyperscalers are going. It's interesting, I mean, I mean, the Snowflake AWS is the poster child for that type of competition and they, they seem to have a bromance going because AWS knows, you know, the Redshift guys might not like Snowflake, but the EC2 guys love them. I mean, it's, so it's, it all sort of comes out and, and seems to work out. But I want to come back to the whole repatriation thing. We had a conversation with Stephen Elliott um, and, and, and uh, Mike Gannon. So it doesn't really show up in the numbers this way. And it's a, there's a weird thing going on. The macro is growing at, let's say, 3.5% IT spend. The, the th big three clouds combined would probably be 200 billion this year. You, know, you guys sell to them, so you know how hot that market is. And they're growing at 20%. The on-prem market, you know, maybe is growing in the mid single digits, maybe. You know, some are shrinking, Cisco, Dell, IBM, HPE, uh, Lenovo, uh, Oracle, you know, kind of soft. So, I think what's happening, I'd love your take on this, is the old, the old legacy stuff is declining. Maybe the repatriation is helping prop up the new stuff, maybe there's some new workloads, the AI workloads, and also that market's bigger, that install base is much larger. But that's why I say it doesn't show up in the numbers because the hyperscalers are still growing so fast. So obviously people are adding you know, dollars to the hyperscalers. How do you square that circle? I get started, I love uh, Rob's perspective here too. So uh, you know, first, you know, we, we, we've already covered the fact that the hyperscalers are charging a premium, right? So they already have a higher margin on the customer. Uh, your modern workloads are running Kubernetes predominantly, containers, 
and we can really densely pack these things. You know, we've done a ton of optimization in our own virtualization software that's giving you greater density per core than you've had before. So our software is licensed per core, so customers in turn are getting greater value from their investments. So I think that's the gray area that may not be uh, appearing in the numbers here, but it's, it's certainly important to the conversation. Yep. When customers have a modern app and they see the steady state cost, on-prem is lower cost for them than a hyperscaler. And that's just, again, it's, it's just basic math at that yeah. point. So customers that have the aptitude to do it, that's what they're going to do. It's doing. renting is more expensive than owning. I mean, we, we know that, and you're right. I mean, Amazon's AWS's operating margin is 35%. It's not quite Broadcom operating margins, but but a different business. But but still, it's 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 an infrastructure. It's basically a hardware company, AWS, with 35% operating margin, which is like Oracle's, and they're a software company. So I I, I understand your point. There's a there's an umbrella there, um, and so but given that, and given what you just said, that should be a real tailwind, and we should see you know, continued momentum in the on-prem business, um, and I. I would expect that, but I also see continued hyperscale growth. I mean, it's just astounding. So maybe another way to think about this, right? There is the hyperscale growth, and you actually kind of double click on this hyper hyperscale growth. There's companies that are focused on the digital native companies, okay? There's a growth in the digital natives. Now, you could separate out the so-called digital natives from a traditional enterprise, right? So there's cloud companies that serve these digital natives, and there's growth there. Then there is these cloud companies that have their existing software stack that they move into their cloud, and then they kind of show it as their cloud you know, growth, right? So there's another one. But then when you start talking about Dell, Cisco, and the others, those are generally hardware companies. So yeah. in general what you're seeing is there's more efficiency coming out of the hardware just because there's more and more transistors being fit in the silicons, and generally there is an eroding price curve on the hardware and so on and so forth. But when you kind of look at it in the overall context of what you might see from the hardware company's revenues not keeping up, what you don't take into account is the fact that still, these enterprises are still spending a lot on the software, the application software stack, the database software stack, so you have to kind of add all of that up, including the services cost of it, and then say, okay, what does the growth there look like compared to somebody like the clouds, right? So, I, so maybe yeah, yeah. we'll have a double click of math I mean, that and, needs and, to be and done that's here. What, that's why I think AWS is actually a good example because they are, essentially are a hardware company with some yeah. PaaS. But by the way, our research suggests that their, their, e, their EC2, their compute, is now under 50% of their revenue, which I think probably occurred sometime during the pandemic. So there's other services, data services. But, and but I mean, I, I think what the, the, having been there and other partnered with all of yeah. the hyperscalers. What I, what I look at, and from a cost curve perspective for them, is the layer stack, because yeah. they are building off those core services, which is, quote unquote, the hardware layer, and then they're building that up, and some have taken a different approach where they have single stack products, and I, I think I, that's why when you say Google and you know, being able to be uh, you know, competitive and you know, compl you know, complete, to some of the stuff that they're doing in the AI space, I look at them as that they they went there first, and and I would say Bedrock was a little bit, you know, behind on that. From that, are you seeing that people are are not only comparing against, but it's it's workload by workload that they're comparing it, or is it hey, you know, that's the what Hawk was talking about of being broken, and CIOs and uh, CEOs have to get aligned on you've got to have a full stack so you get these efficiencies and cost reductions. Because to me, that, that's the difference. With your, your, when you're selling private AI, it's you got the whole stack versus it being piecemealed. Yeah, and that's the thing, that's like you have to, and that's, that's a key thing that Hawk's trying to make, I, I would say, a point is, if you're, if you're saying, well, it is what it is, and I, and I accept my internal org structure as this like sunk cost that I'm just never going to be able to break that, then, you know what, it's, it's, you're not going to get the same results, right? We're saying that you have to take this harder pivot and you're, you have to rethink your approach, just like the, in the cloud, right? I can't tell AWS how to build their storage stack and I'm fine consuming a service from them and I'm fine paying a premium. So what we're saying is you can get that same level of service, that same level of automation at a lower cost with us. To us, it's a no-brainer. Are you going to are you are we going to replace all your SaaS in the cloud with us? Of course not. It makes no sense. But for the 
applications that you're trying to build using containers and maintain control right, of the app stack and your intellectual property and not bind them to some type of proprietary storage interface, we're the best option for you, period. And that's your home court advantage, no question about it. I mean, we've never advised people rip out their core VMware infrastructure and move it into the cloud. I mean, that's just, that's just that would be bad business. Uh, but you're going right after their Achilles heel, which is cost. Of course, the cloud strengths are, they got you know, great developer affinity, and they have really strong data stacks, sometimes overly complex, but they still got a, and they have a, a marketplace and an ecosystem that's very strong. And those are the things that I, I know you're very much aware of, but so you got to defend the base and then work on those other pieces. Tanzu attach rates, obviously critical for the developer piece, and um, you know, you sort out the rest as time goes on. The data piece, I think is to be, I think some work to be done there, really interested to see how you guys evolve that, especially for AI. I think our, our partnership for object storage is with MinIO is, is a key part of that. Um, that's obviously a critical component for AI. And then what we're seeing is the customer demand for AI and, and, and really alignment to our value proposition is now creating new pull for modern applications back onto our platform. So that's really, I think, changed the dynamic in ways that it hasn't. You'll, con you'll see us continue to grow the breadth of the data services that we support. And we're getting more um, ecosystem partners looking to us. And we even have the hyperscalers talking to us as well about uh, extending their services uh, to the data center or edge on our platform as well. So there's just even recognition, I would say, on their side that private AI is a valid use case even for them and something that they want to address in the market as well. And, and I think, Ram, Broadcom's generally a misunderstood company. Um, people think, oh, Broadcom's like a PE, they just you know, suck the life out of the companies and leave the carcass, and that's clearly not the strategy. You guys are an engineering firm. Uh, in a way, uh, VMware's got a very strong engineering team. Oh, we you, do, you, you don't need to point to them. You identify, <laughs> you, you identify <laughs> right, you identify durable businesses and, yep. and you invest like crazy and you dominate. I mean, that's the strategy here. Um, and that's, we're clearly seeing that playbook, if I can use that term, unfold with, with VMware. I mean, it's you guys, you live it every day, you and your 26, you know, Other business four. unit partners. Yep. Right? Or 20, you're the 27th, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I actually probably could give you some, you know, a little bit of right. a historical context sure. in the story here, right? Which was, you know, in 2015, uh, you know, my then boss texted me saying, hey, buddy, I want you to go visit this customer in Europe, and I can't make it last minute. I said, hey, you skipped on them last time too, what excuse do I give this time? He's like, no, no, just go do it, I want you to go do it. So I went to see this customer, and you know, um, one of the other uh, corporate execs was there with me in the meeting, he was like constantly looking at his phone. I'm like, hey buddy, Mike, you know, here's a customer, what are you looking at your phone? And then, you know, right after the markets closes, a new set comes out that says, Avago acquiring, you know, Broadcom, right? Next thing you know, my phone's going off the hook, and people are like, you know, all kinds of very colorful words. Who is this company? Why are they acquiring Broadcom? You know, all kinds of stuff, right? Who's, uh, who's Avago? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I had very big, you know, customers reach out to me saying, hey look, we really enjoyed working with Broadcom. Good luck, man, I hope you'll be able to keep your roadmap <laughs> going forward, you know, all the best. And you're being acquired by a private equity company, that's how they run, you know, X, Y, Z. I was like, okay, maybe I won't have a job in a year from now, but at least I've got a year more before this acquisition closes, so I'll just keep doing my work, right? But you kind of look, look back now, you know, 2016 when the acquisition closed to 2024, eight plus years. In my team of over close to 1,400 people, my attrition rate is about 1%. 1% attrition rate in a tech company, wow. okay? And is this any talent out there we want to get, we are able to get. Any talent we want to keep, we don't lose. So what's happened, what happens to us is, Hawk is very, very good at this. He says, look, you're very good at doing X, please do X and go as fast as you can and do X. Don't sit here and think about doing Y, Z or something else. And what we believe in is, every company out there, there is a core business they start with core technology and eventually they reach the peak of their core technology 
And when they are in a public market, they're looking for alternate businesses to grow because that's what the market's expecting out of them. And so they start to kind of dilute themselves in the not investing in the core business. And that's what actually happened to Broadcom in our core switching group. Broadcom was trying to get into the mobile side of the business. We were trying to compete against Qualcomm on the, you know, the processor and so on and so forth. And we, they were really, really starving the core networking business. I came in and said, look, you guys are going to get all the investment you need you know, whether it's a technology investment or a people investment, go do it. We have consistently been them the first in coming out with our products to the market, at least by 18 to 24 months ahead of anybody else. And these are very other large companies that came and said, hey, look, we'll build our own silicon, we'll be better than Broadcom, and it's proven out, you know, one year out, two years out, three years out, we've just continuously out-executed. Why? We have a process, we have an absolute focus, and we get all the resources that we need and we are able to keep the best talent and we have very, very low attrition, right? So why will people stay if they are not doing exciting stuff? And our team stays, we're doing super exciting stuff. I think as you know, VMware goes through this transition, there's always going to be a nine month, 12 month period as they kind of adjust themselves to how hard things and he expects leadership and absolute execution and the customers will benefit from it. So, I, I, I believe they will do extremely well, just like all our teams have done who have stayed on at Broadcom. One of your colleagues at the financial analyst meeting uh, earlier this year, I think it was in April, gave the analogy of the waves. I think he was a surfer. Yeah. yeah, anybody can ride the easy waves, and then it starts to get the bigger, the bigger, the bigger waves, and then the really gnarly waves, that's what you guys ride. Yeah. And it, you know, VMware, kind of the same. I mean, you guys have always had that focus on making stuff work, recovering from failure um, in a way that Makes customers trust you. Guys, great segment. Thanks for helping us wrap up. NVIDIA has announced stock's down 2% in after hours. We haven't dug into it, but we will. Thanks for watching, everybody. Guys, really appreciate your time and the insights. And uh, thanks for having us here. Great show this year. Thank you for hosting us. Appreciate it. You bet. All right, this is, a, this is a wrap. Dave Vellante, Rob Strecce for John Furrier and the entire CUBE team. Guys, nice job. Awesome two sets again. 15 years at VMware, Explore, VMworld. Thanks for watching. Go to siliconangle.com for all the news. Thecube.net is where all these videos are up on demand, and theCUBE research is where all the deep dive research is, and check out theCUBE AI. It's our new rag. Ask it questions, get answers, get clips. We'll see you next time on theCUBE.